Uh, it's great to have you uh, all along with us. And um, yeah, a little later, we're going to be continuing our service uh, from the book of Acts. Um, let's just bow in prayer before we start the service. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for all that you've done and we thank you uh, for Jesus. We thank you that he died on the cross and rose again victoriously and we thank you for his promise that he will return um, uh, to, uh, to get his church and his people. Father, we just pray that as, uh, as we uh, go into your service today that you would speak to each one of us and your name would be glorified. Uh, we just pray these things in your name. Amen. I think throughout the service we're going to be having um, some people from uh, the ESL class. It's English as a second learning. Um, and certainly we're going to make uh, them feel uh, very, very welcome. We're going to start by singing uh, in our, uh, our first hymn, uh, Amazing Grace. Please stand and sing. Yep. said later on, uh, we're going to be having um, a ministry spot. Uh, Helen will be giving it with the uh, English uh, second learning uh, class. And we welcome uh, those who, um, uh, who are a part of that class and families. It's great to have you along uh, as we worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's important to realise that uh, the Gospels, um, Simon's looking at today, uh, is spread to all, uh, all corners of the world uh, in different languages. And uh, it's uh, wonderful that we've got uh, those translations uh, and languages uh, in the, uh, the Bible translated into various languages uh, right around the world. We're going to say a, cr a creed, and a creed is uh, a declaration of who we believe. So let's say the creed together, uh, which is up on the screen. We trust in God the Father, who has revealed his love and kindness to us, 
and in his mercy saved us, not for a good deed of our own, but because he is merciful. We trust in Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, he free us from our sin. The people eager to do good. We trust in the Holy Spirit, whom God called out on us generously. To Jesus, our Saviour, justified by grace, we might inherit eternal life. We're going to have uh, our uh, Bible readings, and uh, Jasmine is going to uh, come forward. Our first Bible reading is from Isaiah uh, 53. Good morning. Um, today's reading comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, um, and, and it's taken from the Easy Read version. It's a passage that's talking about Jesus, but it's written by the prophet Isaiah 454, 450 years before Jesus was even born. Who really believed what we heard? Who saw it in the Lord's great power? He was always close to the Lord. He grew up like a young plant, like a root growing in dry ground. There was nothing special or impressive about the way he looked, nothing we could see that would cause us to like him. People made fun of him and even his friends left him. He was a man who suffered a lot of pain and sickness. We treated him like someone of no importance like someone people will not even look at, but will turn away from in disgust. The fact is, it was our suffering he took on himself. He bore our pain. But we thought that God was punishing him, that God was beating him for something he did. But he was being punished for what we did. He was crushed because of our guilt he took the punishment we deserved, and this brought us peace. We were healed because of his pain. We had all wandered away like sheep. We had gone our own way. And yet the Lord put all our guilt on him. He was treated badly, but he never protested. He said nothing, like a lamb being led away to be killed. He was like a sheep that makes no sound as its wool is being cut off. He never opened his mouth to defend himself. He was taken away by force and judged unfairly. The people of his time did not even notice that he was killed, but he was put to death for the sins of his people. He had done no wrong to anyone. He had never even told a lie, but he was buried among the wicked. His tomb was with the rich. But the Lord was pleased with this humble servant who suffered such pain. Even after giving himself as an offering for sin, he will see his descendants and enjoy a long life. He will succeed in doing what the Lord wanted. After his suffering, he will see the light and he will be satisfied with what he experienced. The Lord said, my servant, who always does what is right, will make his people right with me. He will take away their sins. For this reason, I will treat him as one of my great people. I will give him the rewards of one who wins in battle and he will share them with his powerful ones. I will do this because he gave his life for the people. He was considered a criminal, but the truth is, he carried away the sins of many. Now he will stand before me and speak for those who have sinned. Our second reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 8. I think it's the whole chapter. 
and it starts on page 1085 in your pew Bibles. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. Oh, sorry, I think of. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and was amazed and, and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great. Boasted that he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is the divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptised, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptised, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptised into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you're full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. When they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candace, of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they travelled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water, why shouldn't I be baptised? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptised him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus 
and travelled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Jasmine. Uh, just uh, before uh, the children come up, just a little bit of um, housekeeping for those who are visiting. There's toilets out there to my left. There's also uh, a, um, a room out there uh, for parents, uh, a change room for parents and little ones. And um, uh, there's some kids' packs available uh, for um, uh, to, um, activity, with activity sheets uh, to have after the children's story. And um, yeah, crèche is out there which, for not the five-year-olds, uh, and that they'll be supervised by volunteers. Okay, children, it's now your spot. Uh, if you'd like to uh, come to the front here, I think Mr. Pass is uh, going to be leading it today. Philip lived in the city of Jerusalem. One day an angel appeared to Philip and said, get ready and go south to Gaza. Go along the desert road. Philip did what the angel had said. He left Jerusalem and went down the desert road. As he ran along the road, he saw a man sitting in his chariot. The man was from a country far, far away called Ethiopia. He was an important official for the Queen of Ethiopia. The man was reading from a book of the Bible called Isaiah. He was led like a sheep about to be killed. He was silent. He never opened his mouth to protest. They treated him unfairly and then he died. Philip asked the man, do you understand what you are reading? The Ethiopian shook his head. How can I understand unless someone explains it to me? So Philip explained that Isaiah was talking about Jesus. Jesus was led away to be killed, but he never said a word in protest. Even though his punishment was unfair, he never cried out for them to stop. God had promised that someone would come. God had promised Jesus. Jesus willingly took the punishment we all deserve and the Ethiopian believed God's good news. He believed that Jesus had been punished for him. The Ethiopian saw some water beside the road and asked Philip to baptise him, and Philip did. As soon as they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord took Philip away. And the Ethiopian went back to his home country full of joy taking this good news with him. Wow, what a story. Philip was taken away just like that. And what an amazing story that we too can ask people, do you understand what you're reading? And maybe you too could tell them the true story of Jesus. And I love that. 800 years before Jesus came, Isaiah, he wrote about the one who would suffer. Isaiah was writing about Jesus. He suffered and he died to pay for our sin. And everything that Isaiah said about Jesus, it happened. Jesus is the suffering servant who pays for our sin. He'd suffer, 
He died for all people all over the world. He died for people all over the world. People like this man from Africa and people like you and people like me. Ah, cool. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are the suffering servant. Thank you that a lot of the things that are said about you in the Old Testament, in fact, all of the things that have been prophesied about you have come true in you, Jesus. Thank you that you died on the cross and that, yeah, you can save people from every nation and every tribe and every culture. And we look forward to one day where heaven will be full of people from every tribe and nation and language. Amen. Um, We will sing this song three times. The first time, we will sing all together. The second time, the adults will start and the kids will repeat the ba-ba-do-ba-bas. But then the kids will show us how it's really done because the kids will start and the adults will sing the ba-ba-do-ba-bas. Think we can do that? (laughs) Let's stand up and sing. So everyone together. We all like sheep have gone astray. Ba ba do ba ba. Each of us has turned to his own way. Ba ba do ba ba. But the Lord has laid on him. The iniquity of us all sing ba ba do ba ba Isaiah 53 6. We all like sheep have gone astray ba ba do ba ba. Each of us has turned to his own way ba ba do ba ba. But the Lord is laid on him. The iniquity of our soul sing ba ba do ba ba Isaiah 53 6 <laughs> Alright, it's your turn now. We all are- like Jesus gone to say ba ba do ba ba He's just turned his own way ba ba Okay, while the kids are, are going out, I'll ask uh, Simon to uh, come and uh, present our sermon. Well, it's hard not to get that song out of your head afterwards, isn't it? <clears throat> Let's bow our heads and pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you that you've given us um, your words um, and that we have the privilege of being able to see them in front of us and to hear them and to ask for them to change us. And so we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. I've never done this, but I imagine that working uh, in a supermarket at their checkout um, can be pretty boring. So sometimes what I like to do is to make the job a little bit more interesting for those who serve me. So, for example, um, talking to the young girl who looks a little bit jaded, um, I point to Jenny, who's down the end, and I say to her, that lady is always putting stuff on the checkout and she expects me to pay for it. (laughs) Or if I'm feeling particularly cheeky, I say, see the lady over there? Do you think she'd go out with me if I asked her? (laughs) Well, just like you guys are smiling, it's nice to see them smile. I don't do that all the time, by the way, so just occasionally. Sometimes just a smile and and using their name is helpful enough. Um, How do you communicate joy to people? 
Uh, better still, how do you communicate biblical joy to people? What's, it, what's biblical joy like? I mean, we all have a concept of joy, don't we? Um, we know that it's a little bit like happiness, but it's something a little bit more than happiness, greater than happiness. See, biblical joy um, is not uh, just that emotion of happiness. Um, it's like happiness, but it's actually a quality, quality that we have uh, when God is the centre of our lives. Um, if you like, in this way, joy actually makes us think of, of inward peace, um, of contentment. Uh, it's, it's more than happiness because it flows out of the certainty that our present and our future is held in the hands of Jesus. The reason I wanted to start with this idea about biblical joy is because I think it's a useful lens through which we can look at this uh, chapter, Acts chapter 8. Uh, the Samaritan city experiences great joy when they hear the gospel and the Ethiopian eunuch experiences um, great joy. Uh, Simon the sorcerer, um, well, he has his mind elsewhere and we'll come to all of those in a moment. So let's first look um, at the heading. There's an outline on your um, service sheet and the first heading is Persecution and Joy. Uh, if we're looking at the big picture um, of the book of Acts, it goes a little bit like this. At the beginning of the book of Acts, Jesus says to his disciples in Acts chapter 1, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Um, the disciples know at the beginning of Acts what, God, what Jesus has planned for them and the first seven or so chapters of Acts actually focus on the spread um, of the name of Jesus and his good news uh, in the city of Jerusalem. But as we get further into Acts, we see there's a new phase uh, in the growth of the early church. And I'm confident that this is one of Luke's main purposes, which we will see um, as we go more and more through the book of Acts, and that is... He wants to show us how the church begins in Jerusalem and then how Jesus' words are fulfilled when his words are taken beyond Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. In Acts chapter 7, we saw Stephen taken before judges and executed. Why? Well, for telling people about the good news about Jesus. And in this incident, we get a hint that like Jesus, his followers will be hounded by the people who are in charge. However, as much as it goes against our instinct, the incident in chapter 7 about the stoning of Stephen is actually a good thing because it propels the gospel of joy out of Jerusalem and into the rest of the world. And when Stephen spoke about the gospel uh, in its chapter 7, he spoke about the location of worship for people who believe in God. And it was the shifting um, of a physical from a physical place, that is, the temple of Jerusalem, to a person. So the worship is now no longer which is what he tried to do to the religious leaders, reminding them that it was never actually about a place. The place pointed to the person, and the person is Jesus. This is how God's working in the book of Acts. Persecution propels witnessing Christians out of Jerusalem and into Samaria and to the edge of the world. And as strange as it seems to our ears, there is actually joy in this. Now, of course, we're not happy that Christians are pursued by Paul, as we get the hint, that they're jailed and then some of them killed even. But we can see how God uses Stephen and the persecution um, that begins with him to take the gospel beyond Jerusalem. Uh, Stuart was part of a group of people who were door knocking um, at the university college campus 
Uh, they were there to share the gospel with students uh, in the dormitories at the university. The college kicked them out. Why? Well, because they were speaking to the residents about Jesus. So did Stuart and those who were walking, well, those who were with him, walk out with their tail between their legs and give up on evangelising the students? Actually, no. They were joyful that they had been counted with Jesus and with someone like Stephen, and they took their evangelism instead to public places. Well, let's turn now then and look at the Holy Spirit and joy. Oh, in Acts chapter 8, we read two occasions where people outside of Jerusalem hear the gospel and respond with joy. The first one, which we read about, was where Philip goes to a Samaritan town and preaches the gospel and great joy is expressed in the city. From verse 4, let me read. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralysed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now, the second one um, is at the end of the chapter when Philip speaks uh, to an Ethiopian and he too goes on his way rejoicing. The eunuch asks Philip, tell me please who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And Philip began with the very passage of scripture and told him about the good news of Jesus um, after he was baptised. And Philip was taken away he went on his way rejoicing. So here we have two completely different strategies of the Holy Spirit that lead people to the joy of believing. The two instances are, if you like, are bookends that straddle the story of Simon the sorcerer in the middle. In the two outer stories, we see the Holy Spirit through Philip bring the good news about Jesus in different ways to two groups or and a, and a separate person. And what is common about these two stories is that the joy they receive in hearing and then believing the good news about Jesus. Well, let's turn and talk about the bit in the middle, Simon the Sorcerer. You see, in this story in the middle, we read how Simon the Sorcerer understands the gift of the Holy Spirit very differently from how the Holy Spirit has been working. Simon believes the Holy Spirit is something that can be purchased. Uh, he was a sorcerer. He probably owned books of spells and maybe he was expecting that that's how you could purchase the Holy Spirit. In verse 18, Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the, hand, the apostles' hands. He offered them money and said, Give me this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands might receive the Holy Spirit. Now what I suspect, although I can't be sure about his motives, but I suspect that Simon here is trying to capture another element of spiritual power one that he hasn't had before, um, perhaps to back up the position that he held before or maybe even to recapture it. You see, Peter and John, when they arrived, um, gave him some competition in the popularity contest. From verse 9, for some time a man named Simon had practised sorcery in the city and he amazed all of the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man is rightly called the great power of God. Now the end of this story in the middle produces a different result from the two stories on the outside. In the middle, this person Simon is rebuked by Peter and he says the Holy Spirit is not a gift that you can purchase it is a gift given by God. 
You see, in Simon's world, that's what you did. You purchased a spell. Magic could be purchased. But in the world of the Holy Spirit and the gospel, we're not able to manipulate God into giving us something that we might want. Simon is not trusting in either the gospel of the Lord Jesus, either in the, neither in the presence of the Holy Spirit, or even in a desire to get to know God better. He's placing his trust in gaining a reputation in the world. The influence of money, power, and reputation do not bring us joy. They are a dangerous trap for all of us. Whether you are rich or poor, whether you consider yourself rich or poor, the lure of popularity and potential wealth do not lead to joy. Uh, once upon a time when I was teaching scripture in high school, we would, we would ask the students there who their heroes were and inevitably they would pick um, somebody who was famous, either an actor, um, a singer um, or a sports person, a um, man or woman. But ultimately their heroes were people who had fame and popularity and wealth. But one of my friends would always ask this question at the end of them. Look into the lives behind your heroes and what do you find? Do you find joy? A famous footballer who will remain nameless, very popular footballer, very gifted footballer, has gambled away more money than all of us would ever earn in a lifetime. Stop and think for a moment, who are your heroes? Who are the people that you look up to? Look into the lives behind these heroes. Do you find joy in their lives? Did you ever see Kerry Packer smile? Let's turn now then and look at the final heading, and that is the gospel and joy. That, there's a sense in which I don't actually need to speak about the gospel and joy because I've already hinted and explained where real joy can be found. And when we look at the response of the Samaritans in the city and the Ethiopian, uh, we find that joy is found in receiving and believing the good news about Jesus. Anyway, let's, let's come back to that, to the bookends if you like, and look at the gospel message and see how it is our source of joy. For instance, when we look back at um, Philip's encounter with the Samaritans, what's actually happening? First, we remember that preaching to the Samaritans arose uh, because of persecution. We see here, of course, that persecution is not a defeat of the gospel in God's scheme of things, is it? Isn't it? Persecution assisted the joy of receiving, believing and receiving the gospel as it is taken beyond the first contacts with Jesus into Jerusalem and uh, sorry, from Jerusalem and beyond. Secondly, if we draw our attention to what Philip preaches when we, um, when we see, um, it is the preaching uh, of Christ. That's what he says in both instances, or Messiah. It is this preaching that helped the Samaritans and the Ethiopian to come to faith and thus to receive joy. If you can, I want you to cast your minds back to the book of John, John chapter 4, where Jesus meets a Samaritan woman. Now, this is really important. I can't go into too much detail, but Jesus declares there that he is the one that the Samaritans have been waiting for. Well, like the Jews, they're waiting for the Messiah. 
And this is how the conversation goes. I know that the Messiah called Christ is coming, says the woman. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. That's essentially the same thing that Philip does with the Samaritan and with the, with the Samaritans and with the Ethiopian. In chapter 8, verse 4, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. In verse 34, the eunuch asked Philip, please, Tell me, who is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? And Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. He spoke the word to these people. The word concerns the Christ or the Messiah. And those who believe receive joy. Now, in biblical joy... Uh, is something that is uniquely Christian. Biblical joy is not just happiness, it's something much greater and perhaps deeper, if you like. You see, real joy is not actually an emotion. It's a quality born out of the connection to God through the gospel, through receiving and believing the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And we can look at this very short chapter and we see what fails to bring joy. For Simon the sorcerer, there's no joy because he possesses no desire to be right with God. No desire to understand and receive the gospel. He wants to be free from punishment as we read, but he's not prepared to put himself at the mercy of God. Now we can also look at this short chapter and see what does bring joy. Joy comes when the gospel is preached. That is the good news about Jesus. And when it is believed and received. We can look at this short chapter and we can see that joy is actually independent of our circumstances. That was so wasn't it? With the persecution. Joy is independent of persecution. Joy is independent of suffering. Look again at chapter 7 into the eyes and hear into the eyes of Stephen and hear the words that he speaks when he's stoned. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and they gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Biblical joy is born out of a relationship with God that gives certainty and hope in the present and in the future. If you do not know that joy, then you need to talk to someone today. Be me or David or a trusted Christian friend. But it is a unique joy you need to know that joy cannot be bought. It cannot be bought with your good works. It cannot be bought with money. Joy cannot actually be owned unless it is the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of God in the gospel of Christ through the Holy Spirit. Let's bow heads. Father, thank you for the gospel that is good news that brings joy. We thank you that in Jesus, 
our lives are transformed in the way that we view our salvation and the way that we view the world. That all of our circumstances are changed because you plant joy in our hearts. Father, for those of us who do not know that joy, I pray that you would reveal it to them today and that they might seek out someone with whom they can talk to about. And for those, Lord, who do know the joy, let us be confident in the present and the future. Amen. Just going to give you a minute or so just to reflect on uh, what Simon has spoken about. And uh, if uh, there's anybody here that does want to know uh, a little bit more, um, yeah, then by all means, as Simon said, speak to, to him or Dave or uh, a trusted Christian friend uh, in their congregation. Let's give you a, a, just a, a minute or so just to think about what Simon's just said. We're now going to uh, have a confession, which will be up on the screen. Uh, sometimes there are things that we need to confess um, to God. In fact, we need to confess all the time, don't we, the, uh, of, our, of our sins, because each one of us uh, are sinners. Okay, so uh, on the screen uh, is the confession. We're going to confess these things. For turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us. For having just wish without thinking of you. Father, forgive us. For letting ourselves be drawn away from you by the temptations in the world about us. Father, forgive us. For failing you, not only by what we do, but also by our thoughts and words. Father, forgive us and save us and help us. Father, we have failed you often and humbly ask your forgiveness. Help us uh, to believe that others may see your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12 says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who trust him. As, as far as the east is from the west, so far, so far he has removed our wrongdoings from us. We're going to stand and we're going to sing our, our next song. His mercy is more. Let's stand and sing together.
seated. Uh, Jenny is going to come and pray for us. Thank you. Good morning. Please pray with me. Lord of all, the beauty of our world screams out to us of your creativity and power. Help us to hear and praise you. Your scriptures reveal the outworking of your plans throughout history, bringing about your purposes. Help us to see your hand at work and trust you with joy. The conflicts and atrocities we see on our TV news each night and the injustices we see closer to home point to the brokenness of this world. Help us to recognise and confront the evil within our own hearts and call on you for mercy. And the cross reveals your enormous love for the lost, the desire to remove the barrier between you and us. Help us to feel the gravity of our own sin that meant Jesus had to die on our behalf and respond to you in thankfulness and obedience. This morning we particularly pray for the Middle East region and continue to pray for Ukraine. Please bring about peace. Please help the leaders of the countries in those parts of the world to seek peaceful solutions to their conflicts. We pray for an end to hatred and the desire for revenge. We pray for those caught up in the conflict through no fault of their own, who are injured, homeless, fearing for themselves, their families and loved ones. We feel powerless, but know you are a mighty God. We humbly ask for you to have mercy on our world. We pray for our own country. We pray for an end to division now that the referendum has taken place. We pray that our country might be one where all people are treated equally and valued. We pray for our lawmakers and representatives at all levels of government. Thank you that we do live in a country where we don't fear for our lives every day, where health care is free and available for all, and where we are free to meet and worship as we wish. wish excuse me. Please help us not to take our freedoms and privileges for granted. And please help us also to be generous of heart and with our resources towards each other. Holy God, you alone fully understand the mystery of suffering. Hear our prayers this morning for those who are in hospital, those who are carrying the burden of sickness or pain, and those who are facing treatment. In their weakness and anxiety, draw them near to you, provide them with comfort and strength. Give them an assurance that you provide a peace that passes all understanding. This morning we particularly pray for those who have requested our prayers. We pray for Norma Eisen, Rosie Hewitt, Wendy Foster, Norma Stitt, Jen Dush Lush's dad, Fiona Hood, Brian and Lorna Thompson, and the family of Margaret Hickman. We also pray for Sue Schofield. We commit them to your loving care. We pray for the missionaries we support who serve you far away. Margie and Andy Newman in Uganda, Libby and Bruce Hayes in Nepal, Beth and Jeff and their family, Ruth and Gil Appleby with pioneers in Southeast Asia. We commit them to your loving care and ask that you would bless their work they do in your name and encourage them over this coming week. We also think again of our brothers and sisters around the world who are persecuted for their faith. Help them to stand firm. And finally, we pray for our church. We pray for each other. We ask that you would equip Simon, David, the wardens and parish councillors with everything they need to lead us and to grow us spiritually as individuals and as a body of believers. Thank you that you have gifted us in so many ways. Help us to be united by our faith in you and to serve you and each other joyfully and sacrificially. We especially pray for our church family's young people and those who are attending Youth Muster this coming weekend. We pray that they would be encouraged in their faith, learn to love you more deeply, 
and strengthen to walk with you even when it gets tough. We commit all these things to you through the name of our precious Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. So I said a little earlier, um, today we're going to have a, a ministry spot. I'm going to ask Helen to uh, come up and she'll also be inter uh, introducing a, uh, a video as well, explaining that. Well, hello everyone. Um, so we've put together a little video just because we'd love to show you um, some of the things that we get up to on Tuesday during our English conversation and culture class, um, and also so that you can partner with us in prayer. We've collected photos from our classroom, our lessons that happen in the potter's room, but also a bunch of things that we've done together throughout the year. And after the service, um, we've got a morning tea provided by some of the women in our group, just a way of saying thank you. Um, unfortunately, they couldn't all be here today, but some of them have expressed a, a desire to come another time, which is exi exciting. Yes, we will watch the video now. Enjoy. We have two classes running at the moment, one in the morning uh, for more advanced speakers and one in the afternoon for those who um, need a little bit more help and encouragement. Um, I'm now going to just do some prayer and praise points, so if you would like to pray with me. We thank you, God, for your goodness to us and that you have allowed us to teach Aussie language and culture for a whole year to some wonderful women. We praise you, God, that after 12 months of praying, longing and hoping, we now have an ESL growth group studying your word, learning about you and how to live as a Christian and love those around us. Lord God, we ask for more teachers, either casual or permanent, for classes or individual teaching to be provided. Father, we have heard that there is a need for teachers to teach male students. We ask God that you would place on the right people's hearts, perhaps an older couple or blokes who could teach the men. Heavenly Father, you are a good God who knows our needs before we even think them up. Our ministry exists due to donations and all students attend for free so that anyone can come, just like your gift of eternal life is free to anyone that believes in you and follows you day to day. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this church that has already provided learning materials, a building, morning tea supplies and encouragement and a support to Bethany and myself and Ivy. Please, Lord, we would like to buy some specific um, Bibles in particular languages and some of a particular simplified version. We put that need to you. Most of all, Lord, we thank you for the students who trust us as they learn to navigate life in Australia, be that short term or long term. We pray for them that if they are unwell, you will heal them. If they are expecting babies, you will keep mother and baby safe. And we ask your blessing on their children and families as they go about their day-to-day -day life in our beautiful country, Australia. Amen. We just wanted to finish now with a song. Um, in, in, it's a special song to us called Behold Your God. Thanks, Bethany and Helen. It's great to see what uh, uh, the class has been doing and, and how the Lord's working in there. 
Uh, just uh, a couple of announcements um, that um, uh, uh, some notices. You would have received one of those um, uh, as you came in uh, with just a, a couple of notices on there that I'd like to draw your attention to. Um, first of all, um, okay, Christmas carols. The community carols is coming up. Okay, it's only a month away. Christmas is next month. Um, but there's going to be some jobs um, that you might be able to, uh, to help out with um, on, on the night, on the afternoon, whenever you can. So there's going to be some... Uh, uh, so, uh, so even before that, we need to have people um, to supply and wrap lolly bags. Um, we need um, help in preparing some, some props. So if you've got some simple painting skills, uh, that would be good. Uh, on the day, uh, people need to help uh, with setting up, and on the afternoon and evening, uh, there will be some jobs as well, and um, helping kids at, at stalls. And in the evening, uh, at the end, we also need people to help um, pack up and clean up the area. So please uh, keep that in mind. So that's uh, the 1st of December. Um, that's Carol's in the park. Uh, the second uh, thing is the men's dinner. It's this week. Um, it's $20, fellas, if you uh, would like to, to come along. Uh, I think there's a, a, a um, uh, there's certainly the app. There's also a clipboard on the, uh, on the back table. Also see uh, Peter Thomason um, if you'd like to uh, uh, come along. Uh, so Wednesday night, Scott Dunlop, our, fir uh, our uh, previous uh, vicar, uh, will be the speaker. So uh, please come along uh, and let Peter know too if you're uh, bringing anybody uh, on the evening as well. Uh, one other one uh, which is not in your news sheet, um, Joanne has just asked a um, little capo, and I'm not a musician, but I understand it's one of those little strap things that go around the thin end of a guitar. Um, it uh, was one or two of those who have gone missing. Um, if uh, you've picked it up inadvertently, um, just let um, Joanne know uh, whenever, you, uh, whenever you find it. Okay, we're drawing to, uh, drawing to the end of our service uh, this morning and it's certainly been great to have uh, all of you here with us. And we thank um, Bethany and Helen and the ESL class uh, for coming along and families. And uh, it's great to, uh, to have you and to have everybody along. Uh, thanks for everybody who has um, uh, helped out with uh, making the service possible, uh, muso musos and uh, the guys at the back on the computer and sound. Um, it's uh, 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 good that we've got a, a lot of people that are bring, bringing service together. Today uh, we looked at, uh, at continued at looking at Acts and uh, uh, joy in the gospel is receiving and believing the good news about Jesus. And if you'd like to know more about Jesus, uh, more about that joy, uh, please see uh, Simon uh, or Dave or someone else uh, following, following the service. We're going to stand and we're going to uh, sing our, our, um, our next hymn and following uh, the service uh, will be morning tea. So everybody is welcome. Uh, to stay for morning tea, and it's going to be over in the no. hall. Okay, no, please know. stand. Jesus, Jesus. 
victory but jesus crucified no other cure for sin but that our savior died no other hope we have but that he rose again Peace be with you, dear brothers and sisters, and may God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you love with faithfulness. May God's grace be eternally upon all who love our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stay for morning tea to be over in the hall.